process. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Robert. I am the Recovery Guy. And if this is Tuesday, this must be the fix. This is the second podcast of 2020. And I am excited that you are here. Our first podcast of the year was on forgiveness and the um, the aspect and the connection it has with freedom. I hope you had an opportunity to listen to that last Thursday, January 2nd. Of course, January 3rd, I turned 66 years old, and so far, so good. I'm loving 66. Uh, Like I told some of my friends, if 66 is anything like 65, I am excited. However, because my my middle name is Moore, uh, I expect more of 66 than I did of 65, and I hope you expect more from me in 2020 uh, then um, what Juan and, and uh, Jane and, and John and I have delivered uh, in uh, 2019. So um, hold on to your hat. Keep those suggestions coming. Thank you for the amazing uh, response and outpouring of listening and sharing and commenting and all the messages you send me in just a positive regard. It is fuel to my engine. And speaking of which, uh, I was on Instagram this morning just checking out some of my friends and people that I follow as well as people that follow me. And uh, this is my one of my new friends, and her name is uh, uh, Kaylee Cassidy. And Kaylee is uh, starting a new um, broadcast. I think it might be a video cast, something like that. But you can find out more about it. Uh, just go to IG and look at Kaylee Cass. So at K-A-L-I-E-C-A-S-S, and it's going to be called Mindful Mondays. And as much as I know about um, Kaylee, I'm going to want to check this out, and I'm sure you're going to want to take a look and listen as well. Also, I hope you looked up and listened to my man Shane on that Sober Guy podcast. Um, Again, Shane keeps it 100 You're going to want to listen to his fresh, his energetic approach to recovery and wellness. Um, I think you'll appreciate him the way that I do as well. You know, I've been around a long time, as you know, so I'm very picky in particular in in where I spend my energy and listening uh, to podcasts and reading materials and Shane checks every box, and I know he will for you as well. Very excited. Uh, tomorrow, I'm meeting with my daughter, Jane. Jane is my uh, social media person, and we're working on some ideas for 2020. Uh, we, again, we're so grateful to your response, and we're looking for ways to have even further outreach. And I'm going to have an exciting update for you this Thursday on the checkup. So, I hope you join that and listen to what we're going to be doing and ways that we can further engage each other that we might have maximum impact, not only in in our lives, but in the people that God would bring into our life as part of our recovery and our way of giving back. So what's freely given to us. So today's podcast is My view of me and the power it has. My view of me and the power it has. Thank goodness Laura, my wife, is a faithful listener, even more faithful sometimes to uh, Sean Croxton and the quote of the day, uh, because somehow I missed this episode. Uh, The episode is by uh, Marissa Peer, and it's entitled, I Am Enough. Now, I'm going to be providing a link uh, to this, um, to uh, QOD or quote of the day, where you can uh, just click and listen. Um, I also encourage you to subscribe to quote of the day if you don't already. So let's get into my view of me uh, and the power it has. Um, when I first came to recovery, uh, and maybe 
you relate to this. Um, I was told that I had to only change one thing. Big emphasis on only changing one thing. So I, so I kind of thought, you know what? Not too bad, right? Right? One thing. Who can't change one thing? So I asked what that one thing was, and they told me that the one thing was everything. Yeah, I, I sort of hesitated as well when I heard that. I thought, well, how can one thing be everything? Or how can everything be just one thing? And I learned over time what they were meaning. Even though everything has so many components, it's all me. The one thing that needed to change was me, and that was everything in me. However, before I would be willing to go to that extent, I had to be convinced that the person, me, I was doing that for was worth it. You know what I'm talking about? You know, Bill calls it incomprehensible demoralization. For those of you who aren't familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, Bill is Bill Wilson and uh, one of the co-founders of uh, of AA, and he calls it incomprehensible demoralization. We we don't understand. We can't comprehend it. It is incomprehensible, and we are totally demoralized. So we are at this low point of our life, the furthest, deepest part of our life, the darkest arena of our life, and we don't even understand how we got there or what we're doing there. Because when when someone comes from the personal place you and I come from, having done the things we have done and harmed the people we have harmed, we don't have a very positive view of who we are. You know what I'm saying? We, If we love the people we loved or the things that were given, why would we treat them so badly? I was so relieved when I was told early on that I that I wasn't a bad person trying to get better. I was a sick person trying to get well. Has anyone ever told you that? You're not a bad person. I wasn't a bad person. I was sick. We were sick. And I needed to get well. Now, granted, I and you know, we we did some very bad things. We harmed some very wonderful people. But we were under a control that made most all our decisions for us. You know, my dad was a tremendous man. Loved me, cared for me, loved my mom and my six siblings. But my dad was alcoholic. And when when my dad drank, all bets were off. Is that the way it is for you? When you drink or you use or we engage in those other types of negative behaviors if if our if our addiction if our compulsion if our if our sickness doesn't come from alcohol or drugs or uh, another uh, substance do does that addiction does that compulsion make most all if not all of our decisions for us well if you're anything like me, then the answer is yes. Referring to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous in page three or 30, rather, um, this is from the chapter more about alcoholism. And regardless of what your addiction is or where you're coming from, I, I think there's certain things that just have a cross application. So don't be thrown off. Um, please don't be thrown off if, 
if you don't think you're alcoholic or you're not or your challenge is in another arena, please don't uh, dismiss the entirety of the concept because there might be a, something that's specific or particular that doesn't specifically or particularly apply to you. But here it is. And this is just one small part of it. We are convinced to a man that alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. Over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. Again, we are convinced to a man that alcoholics or addicted people of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. That's why, again, we're not a bad person trying to get better. We are sick people trying to get well. We have a progressive illness. It's now classified in the DSM in the psychiatric preferred book of understanding conditions, addiction is an illness. And again, over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. And I love that word never because it's an absolute It is an absolute. You know what an absolute is? In this particular consideration, it's over any considerable period, nothing is going to work. You will always get worse. You will never get better. It is an absolute. It doesn't mean that every every now and then someone will. No, never better. And I think that is a stumbling block for many people who are trying to change their view or their self-image that they don't hold their view against them and they don't understand the power that it has. So what do I do to begin my change, the, my view of me, and to minimize the negative reinforcement that it has over me. Here are some things, and when we talk about absolutes, always, never, I'm going to give you a list of things. It's going to be just nine things, and maybe you have more, maybe you have less, but they're absolutes because every one of them is going to Start out with, I must. There's no bargaining. There's, there, there's no negotiation at this point. I had tried to negotiate my wellness. I tried to negotiate my recovery. I tried to treat recovery like it was a buffet, like I was going to the Sizzler or some other smorgasbord. And I could pick and choose what I would want to do or incorporate or add to my life. But it doesn't work that way. It says, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Did you hear the absolutes there? Completely, not partially. Again, half measures availed us nothing. We never get better if we trade off of partial truths. I love what Father Martin says. He says, you know, the only thing more dangerous than a lie There's actually something more dangerous than a lie. And I love how he articulates this. Again, if you have not heard Father Martin's Chalk Talk, go to recoveryguide.org, look under podcasts, and listen to this articulate 
talk on alcoholism and addiction overall. You know, the only thing worse or more dangerous than a lie is a half-truth. That's where we sort of muddy up the waters between never and always and completely, and we negotiate them or we water them down to where they no longer mean the same thing. I know this because I relapsed early on in my recovery over substances, over alcohol and drugs. And I've even relapsed relationally. I mean, I, I, I haven't had a drink or a drug since April 25th of 1986, but other areas I've tried to negotiate along the way in relationships and employment and in friendships and family and things like that. I, I didn't understand that there were certain absolutes that I had to go by. I tried to negotiate my relationship with God, which I'm sure he finds quite humorous. Have you done the same thing over time? Have we sort of watered things down, you know, where even a, a constant drip of water, consistent, concerted drip of water over time can take a very sharp uh, and pointy surface and round it off just because of that consistent, concerted drip, drip, drip. And if we don't stop the drip, we slip. It might not result in our going back out, but it could result in a failed or never realized, fully realized relationship. And the next thing you know, we're we're not with the person or the place where we want to be because we allowed negativity or our personal view of who we are to to slip and we stopped doing the best we could possibly do for ourselves day in and day out. You know, I was on the phone with um, with Slow Will, my sponsor, again, who just celebrated 40 years of, of recovery. And he's still doing the same thing because it works. His view of himself is still fueled by who he wants to be, and he's never stopped after 40 years of personal recovery. And I never want to stop either, and I and there's still absolutes, there's still must in his life that that he adheres to, that I adhere to, that I hope you adhere to. So here's a list that I have, because again, I need to either begin, continue, or elevate my view of me so not only do I minimize the negative reinforcements, but also increase the positive reinforcements that I've incorporated over the years. So here we go. First and foremost, if you have not done it already, I'm going to say this in first person because I'm going to own everything. And if you choose to own it, by all means, I hope you do. I must stop drinking and or using, or if if it's a negative behavior, if if that's what I'm addicted to, if it's not substance related, I must stop that. I must stop drinking. I must stop using. Have you ever seen a fire go out while you're still pouring fuel on it? Doesn't that sound absurd? I would be standing by a bonfire, right? Or or my fireplace. And as I'm as I'm putting fuel or throwing another log on the fire, I'm telling you I want the fire to go out. And and you would be right to look at me and say, Robert, is there something wrong? Because I know you're saying you want the fire to go out. Why are you still feeding the fire? Well, that's a pretty good question. So I must stop drinking or using or engaging in that negative behavior. As so many of you know, 
I was bulimic. I became bulimic along the way. And I needed to stop binging with my food and and purposely throwing up. I needed to stop that behavior. Because after a while, even the alcohol and drugs weren't enough. And I start becoming destructive in my other behaviors to just elevate. And part of my compulsivity of gambling, there was an adrenaline rush that came along with that. As many of you know my story, I went to Gamblers Anonymous before I ever went to Alcoholics Anonymous or in treatment, you know, because I wanted to do anything but really isolate because I wasn't ready to stop drinking. But once I came to that point and I realized that everything, my view of me had to change, the first thing I needed to do was stop adding fuel to the fire. Secondly, and and these can be in any order, and if you have some others that you want to answer, whatever your list is, I'm down with that. This is not, what I'm saying is an absolute, but you might have an absolutely different list and and I'm perfectly fine. Um, But I must begin viewing myself as someone of value. I must. I will never do the work that recovery takes if I don't view myself as someone of value. Why would I do something valuable if I don't view myself as a person of value? I might start, but I'll never finish. Thank God recovery is simple. It's not easy, but it is simple. And I must begin viewing myself as someone of value. I must begin associating with people who will help reinforce my do my new direction and my view of me. Wow, this is so huge. I'm so glad that recovery is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope. Uh, on the 16th of this month, I'm going to be Uh, Here in the Salt Lake area, I'm going to be going to uh, speak at a uh, Celebrate Recovery meeting to share my experience, strength, and hope because I want to associate with people who will help me reinforce, even in in this phase of my recovery, certain of these things, certain of these things are, are for newcomers. The rest of it is for all of us to continue to engage in. So even at this stage of my recovery, I still want to associate with people who will help reinforce not my new direction, but my continued direction, because I want to increase and sharpen and elevate my view of me. So I find more value in me and understand the power that it has over my actions. I must begin working a program that supports these life changes that I want to make. If there is not something definite, a program that's designed to introduce new aspects of living and changing, then I'm going to be all over the board. I'm going to be that person who's not directed And that direction might be left up to me. And I've been told and you've been told and we agree that my best thinking got me to my lowest point. My highest thinking in my addiction got me to my lowest point. So I need to find a program that's going to work and then I must begin working that program. Another must And you can disagree with these all you want. It does not diminish that they are a must. You can disagree with me. You can argue with me. And and I welcome your right to be wrong. And I know that sounds arrogant, 
but the things I'm sharing with you have worked for thousands, countless, millions of other people. And if that's the argument that you want to take up, I wish you the best, but I also would wish that you would reach out to me privately or someone else, because until we agree to these musts and begin to incorporate them in our life, we will not have success. We will not increase our view of who we are and the negative power it has over us will continue. I must develop a relationship with a power greater than me. Find out what you can gravitate to and develop that relationship. You must, we must. There is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now, not later, not down the road, not next week, but now. Develop that relationship with a power greater than yourself. And the wonderful thing is, you get to choose the power. That's not the must. The must is not, it must be this power or that power. For me in my life as a Christian, I know what my power is and where I drive that from. So whatever that power is for you, you must develop a relationship with that. I must commit or recommit daily to my new path, or in this case for me, my path. I must recommit daily. What we really have, again from the big book, is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual conditioning. I must make a daily commitment to this path. I must. You must. We must. Because again, if I don't make that recommitment or that commitment daily, I'm going to go off to that old thinking. Over time, I will. I've seen more people relapse because they stopped doing what they did to get them well. And recovery and life is not coasting. It is uphill. And you must pedal uphill. You cannot coast uphill because it defies gravity. I must become accountable to someone who is living the life I want to acquire. Accountability is huge. I need someone in my life who will tell me when I'm wrong. I have wonderful people in in my life who do that. Laura is my best friend. She is my partner. We've been together over 31 years. I'm accountable to her. I love it when she comes alongside me. My children do. I have five wonderful children who can say things to me because I'm accountable to them. My sponsor will. I'm accountable to him. I'm accountable to certain friends in my life that that I've gone to them for counsel and advice. We must become accountable to someone who is living the life that I want to acquire. I must change old playgrounds and old playmates. (laughs) That just makes so much sense. I must change them. Don't negotiate. That was my relapse. I thought after, after 71 days of doing this day in and day out, going to me, I was going to meetings. I was doing my thing. But I thought, you know what? I could go back to work for this. I was working for celebrities in the personal security arena in Las Vegas and doing escorting and some other things. And I went back to those old playgrounds and I went back to those old playmates and It didn't take very long where I was back doing those old things. So I must change old playgrounds and old playmates. I must become grateful for what hasn't occurred along with the new positive things that are occurring. Because I am grateful for the bullets that I dodged. I am grateful for the mercy that God has shown me as well as the things that God has provided along this incredible journey of restoration, of reinventing, of resurrection for me in my life. I'm so grateful for that. 
But let me tell you, it doesn't take me a minute to go to a meeting and hear a story and listen to something that happened to someone. And I think, oh my goodness, how could you have lost that child? How could you have gone through that and still maintain your sobriety? And I think, thank God I didn't have to go through that. And we suffer a lot. I'm not trying to minimize what you have suffered or, or, or negate what I lost along the way. But there's some people who paid some price. I go into the prisons here in Utah, and I meet some people who lost things forever. You know, I lost some things, but you know, next weekend, Laura and I are going to be in Las Vegas visiting our grandchildren with my daughter who I walked out on, right? And we're going to have dinner with another daughter that I walked out on. God has restored that with us. But I know some men who did less things than me who will never see their children in a public or free setting again. And trust me when I tell you that is not lost on me. So I am grateful for what did not occur that could have as well as the things that are occurring. I must become grateful. And as I've stated, these are just some of the things. Maybe your list is is a little different. As long as what you're doing is working for you and you're achieving your goal of viewing yourself as a person of value and understanding the positive power that it has, then that's all I want for you. What are your musts? What are the musts that you must do to elevate? Share some of those musts with me. Hit me on Instagram. DM me. Email me through my website. Send something to my cell phone. Help me understand. Maybe maybe there's some things that you're doing that I want to incorporate or I want to share to this podcast audience or, or some of the people I'm meeting along the way. I'm meeting a person for coffee at four o'clock this afternoon, and this person is just at that point where they need to change their personal view and value of myself of themselves has dwindled to the degree that they're lost, and they reached out. If there's something you think I can do to help them, let me know what that is. I I hope that this has helped you today. I know it helped me. I hope you look for the link to Marissa's talk on I Am Enough Again. It'll be in the description of this podcast that JJ will drop for us. I hope you continue to listen, subscribe, comment, and share. I hope you join our Recovery Guy movement. It is a movement, and I know we're moving, and I know we're changing lives. One day at a time, one life at a time. Check out my video segments on recoveryguy.org. And most of all, keep coming back. My name is Robert, and I am the Recovery Guy. I was trying to do it.